Welcome to Britasia TV. You are listening to Gora. Just as a trigger warning, the, the discussions that we will be having today are around sexual assault, child abuse and honour killings. I'm joined today by one of the strongest women I've ever come across. She's dealt with this and a lot more. It's Nina Orlick. Hi. Hi, it's lovely to have you on here. It really is. But let's just get straight into it. I want to know a little bit about you, your your childhood, like who who you are, who who were you when you were growing up? When I was growing up, I was literally um, not wanted. So in my culture, obviously, girls are not welcomed. Whereas when a boy is born, they hand out sweets, they dance, they have a nori, which is you know obviously comes the year after, I think. But when girls are born, they just don't want to know, and that was literally my life. Yeah. And um, what about? Is that is that all the way throughout? Did you have you had good times? Did you have a fun? short period of a childhood it's only until recently I understood the difference between helping out and being a modern day slave when you are living the life that I lived I was not allowed to join in the family fun or speak to anyone my eyes were always down so the only communication I ever had with my parents was non-verbal yeah. um, I was kept in my room and my room didn't have any bedding it had a bed but no bedding and um, it just had lots and lots of books so I wasn't allowed to be part of the family, so to speak, um, which I understand now is a, a form of modern day slavery when you're only yeah. called upon to cook and clean um, and don't have any interaction. So it was quite haunting, if I'm being honest. I was very yeah. neglected. So in terms of you and your siblings, do you have siblings? I've got two older brothers. Yeah. And you are the only girl. I'm seeing the only girl, yeah. So has that, that all stemmed because you were born a girl? Yeah, when I was born, they said that I was a Bothany, which is like an evil spirit, like a ghost type yeah. person. They said that I brought a lot of bad luck on because my father's one of seven brothers, as I told you. Yeah. So there were lots and lots of boys in the family and I was one of the first girls. And with that, they thought I'd brought a lot of bad omen upon the family. Mm -hmm. So at what point did you see things becoming very bad? Like you already said that you felt like you weren't included. But at what point did you realise like, something seriously wrong here so for me everything was normal because i didn't know any different and other yeah. girls i knew from the same community had to cook they had to clean the only difference is they weren't kept away from the family um and to me i was quite a happy little girl you know when they said come and eat, cook i would run down the stairs i was happy yeah. in my own little world and i was obsessed with books i would take piles and piles of books home from school mm -hmm. just to read them because it was an escape um and literally i would sit in my room put my ear against the a sort of a harsh wooden door and I would listen to them so I knew who was coughing, who was walking, who who was talking. I was listening to the kung fu films they were watching, pretend I was with them. I just had this huge imagination but my father wasn't really around as much as he you know could have been. He ran pubs in a different place and he would come and go when he wanted but he would be there every Friday or Saturday and he would always go out to drink with his friends and I was cooking from a very small age for all of his friends. So they would come over, I would prepare the meal, I would wait to clear it up and then I would go back to bed and my mum would stay asleep and my brothers would be asleep. It was kind of my job. Um, and it was when I got to 14, something happened that really made me realise that things were not normal in my life, let alone, you know, in the household. Can you expand on what you noticed wasn't normal? Yeah, I was the victim of child abuse in the form of a gang rape um, at the hands of my father. And it hurts because um, I only admitted this to myself a couple of years ago, but he was the first person to actually hold me down. I didn't make eye contact, obviously, with anyone. So as a young girl, I was literally thrown from table to floor. I was bitten. I was punched. I was kicked. It wasn't just a rape, and people don't understand when I say that, and I don't know what just a rape is, but it was a real vicious attack of almost a frenzied attack on just an innocent child. So that obviously happened at such a young age of 14, and uh, that's not, it's not, no one would ever expect that to happen from their father because the relationship you would always assume to have with your parents is nothing but love, and... Is that something that just continued to happen throughout your childhood or? No, it was um, 
a one-off and I felt I deserved it because that's what they told me that I had brought it upon myself. Um, it didn't happen again. I feared it would happen. But the things that happened after that sort of led my life into almost a domino effect of abuse and neglect again to where I am today. Um, so the way you are brought up those foundations really create your path going forward. I had no self-worth. You know, after that happened, I actually just wanted to die. I used to go to school and look at boys, white boys, and think, why am I not you? Why am I this colour? Because I was one of the only people of colour. And why am I a girl? Because I don't want to be a girl because girls are bad. I thought girl, being a girl was a real burden, the way my parents had told me. Um, but it did lead to a pregnancy, and that led to my mum and dad taking me to a clinic somewhere in the West Midlands. And then when we were coming back from this um, abortion that I had to have, I remember them sitting in the front. I didn't really travel anywhere with my parents ever. And they were both so upset. They were saying things like, what are we going to do with her? You know, in Punjabi, they were going to sit you know, Kikana. They were sort of really upset that I had brought this upon myself because they were blaming me for it. They were saying that I couldn't have an arranged marriage. Nobody would want me that I was dirty, um, you know, and what could they do? And they were trying to battle it between themselves of where they could offload me. And I sat in the back of the car thinking, I'm just a problem. I've been a problem since I was born. Nobody's wanted me. And I thought, I don't want me either. Um, and that week when I got home, I ended up taking an overdose because I just wanted to end my life. And I thought I was doing it for them you know, because we want to please our parents. We're, we're taught we are born to serve them. And I really believed that if I did this, maybe I'd be good in their eyes, but it didn't work. Um, and later on, one of the people that had raped me continuously and stayed till the end came forward. And he was from the temple. He had a turban. He was a very religious person. And he said to my father that I've got a solution. My son seeing a white girl, a gaudy, um, in those days, you know, it was quite common, probably still is, but it was hidden. And what we'll do is we'll get her married to him, but she won't be there for him. She'll be there for me. And she'll be there for my wife to cook and clean like she cooks and cleans at yours. And my dad was so happy. He was so happy. And I thought, what's happy? What does happy mean? How is this happy? Because I, I was paranoid I would go to that house and that he would invite other people that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And this would continue, you know, to be my life. Um, but I did get married. I was supposed to get married at 15. But there was a commotion about how much gold they were going to have and how much money my father, he was making demands. So it was almost like a trade of keeping quiet because there was this threat of they would tell people. Um, and my father was very concerned about how he looked in public, you know, his respect. as yeah. it So that happened, so you got married at what, the age of 16? I got married as a, I just turned 16, turning so I was coming into my 17th year, yeah. So um, I got married, and when I went to the wedding, it was really odd. Nobody came to the house. You know how you imagine yeah. things to be, how you watched, how I watched other people get married. I didn't watch television because I was never allowed, but how I watched other people get married where they have the money, you know, the, you know, the, the whole tradition. tradition. I had nothing. The house was empty continuously. I got ready in the morning. Um, I had a lenga that my an Indian outfit that my um, mum had sent me. It was the first thing he'd ever sent me in my life. I was excited because just he sent me something and it was beautiful. I didn't feel I deserved it. So um, there's a lot of commotion. My father ended up having to give a lot of gold, a lot of money. Um, and in those days, you know, I'm going back to the 80s, he had to buy a lot of kitchen equipment that was really expensive back yeah. then, but they were making a lot of demands. And um, on the day of the wedding, as I said, that I... I was sent home after the wedding, which is not normal. You know, everyone stays at the party and they did then too. But when I got to the party, my um, my father told me to go home. So then when you did get married, did your mum not have anything to say about you having to obviously get married to a son of someone that had raped you? What? But where was she in this in terms of her support or what she said to you? I didn't really ever have a relationship with my mother. Yeah. She hardly ever spoke to me. Um, we didn't really have that mother-daughter relationship. You know, the most she would say to me is come and cook. 
Um, so she didn't have much to say. She was pleased that I was getting married. It was a sham wedding. I wasn't really marrying the son. No. You know, when I did get married, they were all upstairs. I had a room downstairs. So I never, ever really spoke to him that much. I think we spoke a few times in passing. Yeah. So it was a sham wedding. Um, my mother-in-law was exceptionally nasty to me. I can't think of any other word. Um, I've said it before, but one of the things that she did to me that really sort of crippled me, I guess, and I developed um, a really bad eating habit was that she would encourage when well, I was the cook in the house and she would come at the end when I was plating the food and if I plated anything for myself she would throw it all into the bin and say to me to eat out of the bin this is your mother-in-law my mother-in-law so even even when at your picture getting married you you just assume to go into a house where it's just full of love but even then it nothing got better she was very angry, always angry with me. She just seemed like an angry person. And I don't think people understand how much um, in-laws in our culture affect the mental health of a yeah. young bride. Um, I didn't know love. I didn't know what love meant anyway. But she almost belittled me in lots of different ways, as did her husband, you know, my father-in-law. Yeah. They would um, go out for the day to a religious event or a wedding and they would make me strip so I was completely naked, sit me on the floor and time it with metal coat hangers and then the edge of the coat hanger, because it was, it was harsh, it would dig into my skin. And that wasn't for anything other than to show me that they had control because had they said don't move, if I wouldn't have moved, I was so scared all the time. Um, but they played these sort of mental games with me. Yeah. And in terms of your new husband, did he know everything? Where was he in this? Yeah, I mean, he didn't stay there very often because he had this girlfriend. Um, and as I said, that he... Sorry, so he was still with... He's, he continued his relationship with his girlfriend and I knew about it. But to me, obviously, I just accepted everything. I've always been somebody who's very accepting. You know, if someone says this is the way it is, I think that's just the way it is. That's the way my parents brought me up. So I never questioned anything. I never asked why. I never asked anything along those lines. And your father and all of this, was he, did he continue to be abusive? Or did it stop? How yeah, was every, it was literally every day, if not every other day, I was pulling his hands out of my underwear or pushing him off me. Often he would tell me to come in the morning and sit with him because it's the morning prayer that he would do. And it was just the two of us and he would, you know, abuse me. Um, often force himself upon me. And I'm sure that they knew what was happening in the house, but they turned a blind eye to it. But it got to a point where I just didn't want it. You know, I was, yeah. I was, I, I felt horrible about me. I hated myself to a point where I just couldn't continue. Yeah. And did you manage to get a way out at all? Did you manage to get out of the house? You, you did manage to get a job. They wanted me to get a job because they were quite greedy for money. And I discovered um, I was good at stuff, you know, I didn't know it, but I discovered I was always a people pleaser at school, wanting to be at the front of class, you know, put my hand up. Yeah. And I and I ended up getting a really good corporate job. I was the first Asian woman who became a manager at the age of 17 in this large corporation, but I did it to please them. I thought the more money I bring, maybe they'll leave me alone because it was a joint account. I didn't see any of the money, but it meant I would go to work and I would be this completely different person. I would open the door and and say hi everyone you know and I, I sort of almost changed who I was I had a different kind of person yeah yeah it was always like a stage presence I guess but they didn't know me they didn't know what horrible yeah. things I was going through they didn't know that I hadn't slept the night before they didn't know that I was cold I was hungry they just saw me come in and do my and just be your happy self at work not knowing and I liked the way people reacted to me when I smiled yeah they smiled back and then I'm right in thinking that you did manage to finally go back to see your parents as well. Yeah, I made a friend at work. Um, she was Punjabi and I really thought she got me, you know, she really sort of understood and she saw my ankles bleeding and I told her she was the first person and she had a boyfriend who was Nigerian and they both seemed really caring and I believed everything they told me. Again, I believed if you had told me something, I would have believed you. I was one of those people. And they said, you know what, if you go back to your parents, it won't be that bad because you're 21 now. And 
I said, I haven't seen them for four years because when a girl gets married in my culture, she's no longer their daughter. And she goes, oh, that's what they say. It's not what they mean. Go back. And I thought, well, I can't keep doing what I'm doing, putting up with my father-in-law, you know, the smell of his breath, the way he would force himself upon me. I didn't want that anymore. So I decided I would go back and I just ended up not going home that day. I got on the bus back to my mum's, but somebody had seen me out of the community, you know, an auntie. And before I got there, they knew I was coming. It's not word of mouth. Everyone just knew. And how did they, how did they react? Were they happy to see you? Being the person I am, I was away with the fairies. You know, I sat at work that day. I remember it really clearly thinking, I'm going to go home. I'm going to be pulled in and hugged. Um, but I wasn't. Yeah, you just didn't receive that love that you were assuming or thinking that you would get being back after so many years. No, the only way I can describe it is that they were furious. They were so angry that it was almost like they were possessed. Um, my father, during my childhood, told me you would bury me under the floorboards. I think a lot of girls are told that, that if you do anything wrong, they will kill you and bury you. But there was something different about this time, the way I, I heard him speak and the way my mum was speaking. And they were they were sure they were going to kill me and they started talking about how I'd landed in the gutter, how they can't show their face in public now, people are going to laugh at them, that, you know, who who's going to come to their house, that everyone's going to spit at them because I brought shame by leaving my arranged marriage. It's been four years, I've not had a child. You know, and they started to throw all this abuse at me um, and I just knew I'd made a mistake. I just knew it, but it was too late. There was no going back. I couldn't go forward. There's nowhere to go. I was almost like a, a rabbit caught between the headlights sort of thing. I was just, I was stuck. Um, and then the physical side started where my father's next professional wrestler. My brother was there, one of my brothers, he's six foot tall. And they started to beat me, but it wasn't a beating. It was, it was almost there as though they had decided that was it, they were going to kill me. And I was bouncing off the walls and they broke my arm, they ended up breaking my jaw. They ended up beating me to a point where I was covered in blood. And when I did fall down, they stamped on me, kicked on me and my father pressed his foot against my throat. Yeah. And at that point, I believe I just left my body because I stopped feeling, I didn't feel anything. And I remember almost looking at myself from the outside in and I was like, that's it, that's it. But something was saying it's not time yet. And when I did feel like I was back in my own body, I just remember watching, they've got this carpet and I remember it was a swirly design. I remember watching the blood always trickle down my nose onto the carpet, but I couldn't move. I didn't feel anything. I just couldn't feel anymore. No. So how did you, you really, your flight and fight kicked in and you, you fought, you fought to live. How did you get, get through that? What what was it? that They actually left me. They walked out because my other brother came and he said, don't do it here, let's take her to India, let's kill her there. You know, those words we use, the word honour killing was thrown around, you know, Izzat was thrown around. And they all almost like decided, right, that's it. And they walked out. My mum, my sister-in-law, my dad, both brothers just walked. And I could hear them walking, but I was just so in and out of consciousness. I didn't know what was happening myself. And I lay there for days um, and your body gets stiff when you're lying somewhere. And I couldn't move. I was in so much pain, I don't even know how I bore that pain. But my um, mum always had this friend and she was, we call, you know, we call all of our mum's friends auntie and we call the dad's yeah. friend's uncle. And she was really kind and she must have come over one day. Um, she used to come to watch films with my mum. And she opened the door and said, they're going to send you to India and shut the door quickly. But that kind of woke me up a little bit because I'd kind of been in this like dull state almost. And I thought, what are you going to do? Because I had this habit of, since being a child, not having friends, I had this habit of talking to myself. But I was really scared because I had a whole house full of angry people. And I thought, what are you going to do? And I thought, I can either give up or I can get up. I couldn't walk, I couldn't get up. I tried to crawl and I fell down, I tried again. And eventually I started to pull myself, like shuffle forward on this part of my arms. And I did get to the door, then I couldn't open the door. And it was like battle after battle, little stages of getting out the house until I got to the outside garden. And then the, my dad had this six foot wall, you know, they liked to have their fences high. Yeah. 
And my dog, who was the loudest person in the house, that the neighbours would complain, everyone would go. She came and sat next to me, and I thought, well, she's going to, this is it now. They're going to catch me. I'm not going to get anywhere. But she didn't bark, and it sounds weird, and people are like, oh, did the dog talk to her then? You know, they make silly comments, but she almost encouraged me to go because she looked at me and she looked up, and I thought, okay, maybe we need that from somebody, just that little sign that we can do something. And I'm not sure how I did it, because it's really quite impossible, but I did do it because I knew if I didn't do it, I wouldn't be here sitting with you today. Yeah. And then you managed to get yourself out of that house, and where did, where did you go from there? I went to um, a park literally across the road and I passed out. And when I woke up, it was still early hours in the morning. So yeah. I guessed, you know, I say five o'clock, but I guess, I don't know. And then I made my way to a taxi rank and visibly I looked like something out of a horror film. Um, and he was an English guy. And he said, do you need help? You know, let me take you to a hospital, police station. I said, no, I want to go to my friends. Because, you know, I thought people are going to ask questions. I yeah. can't answer them. I don't know what to say. I was really scared, really scared that they were going to find me. So he said, all right, get in the back. He put a blanket over me. And I realised looking back how lucky I was because it could have been anyone. But I do really believe in angels and I do believe they've crossed my path so many times. And he took me to my friends and I said, I've got no money. And he said, it's OK, just let, let's get you sorted. And my friend obviously didn't answer the door because I think it was too early. I... um said to him, I don't know what to do. He said, there's a police station across the road. I ended up at the police station and I, I broke down. And the policeman was really nice. He was a chubby character. You know, I remember him, I remember his name. I remember everything. Started to write everything down. And he was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to take photos. And then he said to me, something's got to be done about this. So what happened exactly? I said, well, it's an honor killing. And he just put the, he just put his folder down literally threw it down as though to say I don't want any of this cultural stuff I don't want to deal with it and I looked quite surprised but he ended up sending me to hospital in Kettering which is in Northamptonshire and I was there for nearly two months but nobody would come and talk to me because on my file there was a yellow sticker saying honour killing so nobody came no one questioned what's happened and because I didn't think I was worth anything I didn't ask for help, but I watched everybody visiting their relatives. But I would say to myself, that's how it's supposed to be. So when you have somebody you care about, that's what you're going to do. And I would get happy that, you know, oh, it's seven o'clock, they're going to get, so-and-so is going to come, and I would wait for that person to come around the corner with flowers or grapes. But I was alone. I was just very much alone. So not only have you been let down by your family, the police weren't there for you either. And then you were obviously in the hospital and you've made your way out. Who did you turn to? Who did you go to? I ended up going to um, a women's refuge. Um, and I couldn't hack it there. Thank you. I couldn't hack it. Um, there were a lot of women in this refuge that were dealing with drugs and alcohol substances because they were numbing their own pains. They were dancing with their own demons yeah. and I didn't get it. I, did, I just saw, this is bad. Oh my God, she's drinking. Oh my God, she's smoking. Because that's how I was taught to believe that they're in that, you know, they're not supposed to do that. So I asked the lady that was downstairs, can I please have some money? I'd like to go to my friends. And she gave it to me. And I think she was quite happy to get rid of me. Um, and when I got to my friend's house, he answered the door, her boyfriend, and he said, oh, you know, we've split up. It's been a while. Where have you been? Uh, we don't know what happened to you. You don't come back to work. I'm not working there anymore. I said, oh, he said, what's happened? Because I was still, you know, my arm was still in a, in a sling. And he said, well, come in. You can stay here, but you have to pay me rent. And I thought, well, he's so kind. He's giving me somewhere to stay. And I thought he was this amazing friend, you know. And... and um, to be honest with you, anybody could have offered me something at that point. I was so desperate to be looked after in a way. Yeah. But I didn't really understand what looked after means. So for me, someone saying come and stay was a huge deal. And I went there and um, I did get a job really quickly, even with my sling on. I got a job in the local council and I was um, funny enough working with people of our own culture, getting them back to work. And... Um, 
things progressed. I was there for about six months, I'd say. And my landlord had a party and he said, do you want to come to the party? And I thought, I've never been to a party. And I, you know, we used to think about stuff and he was like, oh, you know, get ready and everything. Go get some clothes and everything. And I did. I really got ready, went to the party. And obviously I didn't drink alcohol because it's not something we, we were allowed to yeah. do. So he got me a Coke, but it wasn't a Coke. I didn't know what it was. And I said, it tastes odd. And he said, it was Pepsi. So I believed him because why wouldn't I? And I don't remember much of that other than when I got back, I passed out. Um, and then I realized later on that he'd raped me and taken advantage of me. But the best thing happened to me through that ordeal because I gave birth to a gorgeous girl and I felt I'd broken that cycle because I celebrated her. <laughs> so when she was born, I was really happy and I really selfishly needed her. I needed something to want to live for because I didn't want to live. I had no focus, no belonging. I didn't belong to the Asian community anymore because I was a black sheep. I'd left an arranged marriage. My parents were happy. So she gave me the will to live, I guess. And her being a girl was so significant because it meant I would give her everything. My mum didn't give. You know, I would speak to her the way my mum... I wish my mum would speak to me. I would love her the way I wish my mum would love me. And I promised her, I said, I will do everything within my power to make you happy, to give you the education, to make sure you don't go without. Yeah. And I'm right in believing you have uh, some sons and a daughter, is that correct? You have, you have two sons. Yeah, I have. Um, I ended up getting pregnant again. Yeah. Um, my partner, he didn't really want to be with me, but he kind of was there. Um when I had her, I was determined to make money. And um, I've, I've always been very good, very entrepreneurial. So I ended up um, buying a house in the same year I rented a shop and I was selling mobile phones. I was doing really, really well. Yeah. So well that the main company, the supplier came to me and said, we want to work with you directly. I just had this gift of being able to speak to people and understanding what they needed. So I um, had her at nursery and I ended up saying to him, I want three children, I'm one of three because we have this weird thing in our heads. And he didn't really want to be with me, but he was still there because the money was coming in too. I didn't notice that till later. Um, he'd stopped working, he wasn't working. So it was just me working and ended up having a son. And when he was born, um, my partner was really happy. He was really happy that I had this boy, you know, and he was super excited and then I got pregnant again quite quickly and by this time he was going out a lot he was seeing other people I knew he was seeing people but I didn't know what to do about it you know every Friday or Saturday he'd be out doing his thing and I would be at home with the kids but that's what made me happy so I didn't question it I didn't say why am I not with you because I didn't think I was supposed to be with him yeah and um I ended up getting pregnant for the third time and his, his violence had escalated, you know, he was doing things like he, where the children um, were asleep, he would ask me to run a bath, I would run the bath and would force my head under the water and tell me if I do anything, if I don't provide, it's going to kill me. He set my pillow on fire when I was asleep and my daughter, she must have been about seven, she put the pillow out. And the second time he set the pillow on fire, my house on fire, so I woke up from the smell of my hair being on fire. But it was always things he would say to me he was doing it because I had done something. I had done something to create him being angry. And I believed it was me because I had been blamed all my life. So why wouldn't I think it was anything else? I um, ended up getting pregnant again. And during this pregnancy, I was working really hard. And he had this habit of being behind me and pushing me. And he pushed me down the stairs when I was what, you were pregnant. I was quite close to full term. Um, I think I was eight months pregnant. And the way I fell obviously caused a problem. And he left me. He went out because he was going out anyway. Um, my daughter was at a sleepover. I had my, young, um, my son with me, my first son. And I just knew something was wrong. And when I reached down, I could feel a foot. So I didn't know what to do. And it's really weird the way the universe works. But my old school friend had been trying to get on hold of me for a long time she's greek cypriot and they have a similar culture to ours and it was that day she came around and um she's not the best person when it comes to a problem but she was there 
and she got an ambulance. We got my son looked after by somebody and I went to hospital, but she couldn't cope with it. It was too much for her. She can't deal with the stress. So I was on my own. And when I gave birth to Tyler, his name was, died shortly after. And I didn't know what to do. Because all the other babies were crying on the ward. And I didn't have my baby crying. And then when I woke up in the morning, they had put his cot really far away because my partner had come to get my friend and take her back and he said just to leave them, but nobody came. I didn't see anybody for three or four days. I didn't see my children. I didn't see my partner, nobody. And then somebody came from the hospital and said, look, you have to organise a funeral. I said, I don't know what, in my culture, I don't know what we do when this happens. So I actually remembered my mum's number and I rang it. And I'm scared, but some t somehow I thought, because I've given birth, she'll understand. But she said, oh, you died for me a long time ago. Now your baby's died. That's good. It put hung up on me. And um, I asked my partner, I'd like to organise a funeral. He said, well, it's not a real baby, which I didn't understand, because when you're carrying this child, it's obviously real to you, and you give birth, and it's a real baby, but the outside world doesn't see it. So the hospital took pity on me, I guess, and organised a small funeral for me. Um, and I found it really difficult after that. I kind of switched off, I guess, the little bit of um, resilience I had had gone. I just didn't want to be. I just wanted him back. I used to stand at my back window and look up and speak to God and say, why did you take him? You've got to give me back what you took. Why did you do it? You know, I was longing. I had two children and I was neglecting them. I, I didn't go to work. I just couldn't get my head around it. It was probably one of the lowest times of my life. And then um, I did get pregnant again. And this pregnancy wasn't an easy one. But my partner said he's not going to do anything. You know, he doesn't want to be near me anymore. He's got somebody else. And he just doesn't like me. He said that I was too fat, too ugly, that he found me repulsive, that... I forced myself upon him, I just need to look after the children and work and just focus on that. And when I had this baby, I asked them to take me into a pink room because I was determined it was, I was sure it was a girl, but I had a beautiful little boy. And he kind of gave me that hope, I guess, that I needed, that things were going to be okay. Um, and life changed. And, and life just went on like that with a lot of abuse. The children weren't allowed to have friends over as much. I wasn't allowed to speak to anyone. My car was tracked. If I went into a supermarket, I had to show a receipt. I avoided any Indian areas in case they saw me because of my parents. Yeah. So I was subjected to a lot of domestic violence. So was, was there a point where it was just you and your kids on your own? Your husband had left and he had gone with someone else? Was he still around? Was he was he in and out of their lives? How was that? He didn't leave. Um, he didn't marry me. He said I wasn't good enough to marry. I wanted to get married because obviously in our culture you don't have children. Yeah. And you see, the thing is people say, well, if it's that bad, why didn't you leave? But also in our culture we're taught you don't go around having children different people and if you make your bed, you lie in it, so to speak. Yeah. But I just didn't know any better. Um, so he didn't ever go anywhere, but he used to go on extended business trips sort of thing all the time and he would be out a lot of evenings um so yeah it wasn't really it wasn't a normal family environment at all for them either because they witnessed a lot of domestic violence well, so i was going to ask how was it for your children to firsthand obviously see how you're being treated and abused in in front of them it, it obviously takes a toll not only on yourself but on your kids as well? Yeah, I don't think parents realise that uh, if a person who's being abused, they don't realise that it's not healthy to stay in a relationship because of the children. Yeah. Um, in my head, I was staying there because of them, because of them, and also because I didn't know that I was allowed to walk away, that I thought I had to stay there regardless. It's a long culture to just stay there. I just felt a bit trapped. I felt, I didn't feel trapped. I just felt it's all I deserved. I felt like I didn't deserve any better. And I, I felt I was almost lucky because that's what he would tell me. Yeah. Um, and he would tell me nobody would want me. So I assumed that was the truth. You know, I took it as, as literal truth. Um, he wasn't very engaging with them. He didn't really go to their parents' evenings or 
even sports days and things. I didn't yeah. miss a thing. I made it a point because I didn't have an auntie or an uncle or a nanny or a, a granddad that I would be there. So I was there as much as I could. I was almost compensating for everybody else. But he was quite an absent father, even though he was living with us. Mm -hmm. So from there until now, how did you, how did you kind of get yourself out of it into into the woman you are today? What was that journey? Well, like you asked earlier, did they ever ask if there was something wrong or did they say anything? My daughter went to university um, to do her first degree and she started to understand that this is not normal for yeah. your parents to be in this way, you know, and she questioned him and said that you're not supposed to, don't do those things to mummy, you know, the things you've done are really wrong. You can't treat her that way. I suppose she was protect, trying to protect and he um, stopped us communicating. So he cut her off. So when she was at university, I wasn't allowed to speak to her at all, which was really difficult. Yeah. Um, my son started to stand up to him yeah. and say to him, you know, just sort of almost challenge him, I guess is the right word. Yeah. And um, at one point he did turn around, say something to him, which meant then he got hit. And I said that he won't hit my children, you know. So he went off to boarding school because I thought that was a solution. I didn't think all I have to do is walk away. I was, I don't know, I just didn't think. My my reality was very distorted. I just didn't think straight like most people would. And that just left me and my youngest son then. And uh, my youngest son developed an illness, um, an autoimmune illness, which meant he ended up, it's from stress, he ended up in hospital a lot which meant he ended up having operations. And he was very young, and you know, I'd separated the boys and they were very close, they were thick as thieves, and it meant that suddenly he was on his own. So we didn't have that person to bound, rebound off or to talk to. And um, not doing the right thing, looking back, but he, um, when we came out of hospital, my daughter received a picture message, um, text message saying, I'm sorry from my partner, her father. And instantly she knew something was wrong because I was asleep on the on the sofa, which I never did because I had insomnia from the pillows being burnt. And also he would lock us in our rooms at five in the morning and sorry, he would lock us at 11 at night and open at five in the morning. So sleeping for me was really not, not, not an option. I re rarely slept. Um, and her brother was like slumped on a table and she just knew that something had happened. She didn't know what. Mm -hmm. She said she should have called the police. But you know, when you're in that situation, you don't necessarily do what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And she ended up calling me. When I answered the phone, I said to hold on, my throat was really, really like dry. And I was struggling to breathe. And I ended up going to the kitchen to get water and he turned all of the taps on the cooker on the gas like the gas the gas so the house is full of gas and people say well can you die from that but you can you know yeah. carbon monoxide's a killer but also it would have taken one thing to spark something and it would have just been one big explosion and i know he knew that i know that he the would have known that there. his intention yeah. was there but he almost felt guilty to admit it and send her that message but she saved our lives you know there's no two ways about it had she not made that call Again, I won't be here. So I know I've escaped death so many times. But that led to us being removed. Um, social services, because my son spoke out of school. He was super brave. I still didn't have that courage to speak out because it's really hard to ask for help. It's so hard. And he spoke out and they took it very seriously, which they should. I became a high-risk case. They put me into a, an emergency housing, which was not fit for anybody you know when I walked through the door I remember looking back and smiling at him as though to say it's going to be fine but I was lying to myself yeah. um as soon as my foot hit the floor there was like a squelchy noise because the carpet was just sodden with urine and the walls were just covered in human feces so whoever lived there before must have had young children that yeah. were emptying their own nappies out I guess but that led to us becoming homeless um and that led to Again, another angel um, called Nikki Bliss who came into our lives and said, look, I know what's going on with your lives. I know what's happened because she and I had spoken before at school. And she opened up her doors to us. You know, she was kind, um, Christian lady, and she just didn't think I was someone else's problem. Yeah. She wanted to do something and she took both of us in and she let us stay there for as long as we wanted. But me being me was, I'll stay for a month. I'll cook and clean for you. She said, no, you're not cooking. I, I don't want you to cook, but 
you can stay for that period or longer, it's up to you. But I wrote it down. I wrote 30 days down on a bit of paper and every day I would go and work in factories for two pounds an hour, packing the same factories I'd done thousands of pounds worth of deals and I was working in there. I was cleaning people's office toilets. I didn't care as long as it was a respectful job, so to speak, I was doing it. I was setting up people's businesses, VAT returns, I was doing everything. And within a month, I had enough money then to move out into a house of our own. And then is that how everything, did everything slowly start coming together? What, what kind of happened from then on? It's not been a, you know, happy ending, no. if I'm being honest. Um, it's a slow process, yeah. I um, realised I'd been a really bad mother because no one teaches you how to parent. We were saying upstairs, no one teaches you how to parent and I hadn't had the best examples of parents. I hadn't had the best example of a partner either. And um, I let my children down because I never asked them once, how are you? You know, they'd been through years, their whole life had been this game almost to escape their father's shouting or, you know, you've got to put the remote control back before he comes or, oh, he's coming, let's switch the TV off and pretend we haven't done anything. You know, we we ha we led this walking on eggshells type of life throughout their, their since birth to when they were. And um, my son who became homeless with me, I never once said to him, how are you? I just carried on doing things, right, we've got a house now, let me get a sofa. What TV do you want? What kind of bed do you want? What kind of desk do you want? I never once said to him, look, are you okay? Because we're not used to talking to our children. We, yeah. we always think for them. We never say, we never stop. We just carry on as parents. And I nearly lost both of them because my other son, who was at boarding school, had been self-harming. I knew nothing about it because internally he was battling with guilt as well because he wasn't the one who was homeless. And also, I think he saw himself as my protector, but it was never on him to feel that way. Yeah. You know, he was my child. I was responsible for him. And my other son, he struggled because his father tried to kill him. He was playing. They both played for um, West Brom, you know, in their academy. They lost. He lost that whole lifestyle that he had, the whole getting up and training his routine. He, he lost who he was, I think, as a person. And um, he tried to kill himself. He, You know, he left me a suicide note. Um, and getting him back was really difficult because he travelled out of the country, but we did get him back, but it wasn't the same child. He was an angry person who was full of hate and probably hate for himself because he couldn't deal with the situation, but we take everything personally, you see. Um, I was taking it personally that he hates me, not understanding it was never about me, it was always about him, and I just needed to leave him alone. So I stopped trying to force medical doctors and and medicine onto him and I just let him be and I decided this noise that was going on in his head needed to just be left alone and I gave him some boundaries you know he was throwing plates I said not to do that but I just loved him I loved him and I let him know he was loved I let him know if he wanted to talk I was there I let him know and slowly and slowly you know he's been getting better but I moved away um, to London from Leicestershire because I was forced to because of the police saying they can't protect me anymore. And I think that was probably the best thing I did because suddenly I was not looking over my shoulder to see if someone knew my parents, not looking to see if my partner was around or anybody he knew. And I meant I could go to the shop and actually buy something without thinking too much into it rather than running and running out. It meant I could walk and actually look at the trees. And it's the smallest thing for me. People think when you're free that you want to wear short skirts and cut your hair and put loads of makeup on. They think that's what freedom is, you know, in our culture. But freedom's just being allowed to live without fear. And I discovered a lot of love for me because I had this realization that I was, I was grounding, which is like standing on the grass and um, saying my affirmations because I learned that's what you should be doing. And I realized that everything everyone had ever told me was their opinion. You know, they thought I was fat. They thought I was ugly. They thought I was stupid, not tall enough. Was So my dad used to say all the time, you're not tall enough. She's too short. She's too short. Always going on about it. And that was one of the first things I said to myself that you are tall. And I said, I will believe what I want to believe. And I let go slowly over time. Anything negative that anyone had put into my mind map. And I replaced it with something 
And if it wasn't quite what I wanted to be, I would add the word yet or, you know, soon. So I'm fit. I'm not quite fit yet. You know, I'm not got, I'm not yeah. healthy. I'm, I'll be healthy soon. And um, I loved who I was. I realized that throughout their tyranny of keeping me a certain way, they've actually kept me very pure, I guess. I wasn't exposed to anything. So all I did was run down the stairs to make them food from love. You know, I would put a little bit of salt extra for my mum. She liked it. My brother liked a jar, you know, it's like a pickle. I would put that for him. And everything I did, I didn't do it out of hatred. Like, I've got to go. I would be happy because that was my extension of love. And I realised there was a lot of love in me. I was always giving it to others. But I also started to give it to myself. And my children I hadn't been the best parent, but I'd brought them up the way I wished I was brought up, by playing games with them, by teaching them nursery rhymes, by reading books with them, by bedtime, you know, teaching them to meditate, those sort of things that I really wished I had had. Um, and I became this person who understood she had let go of everything bad that had ever happened to her. I don't hate anybody in my past, not my partner, not my parents, not my in-laws that were then. I don't hate them. I love them because they taught me to love unconditionally. And they gave me these gifts that I can help other people because now speaking out about it, yeah. as I was saying to you, I've had nearly 9,000 messages from women, men, young children, as young as six, that have been trafficked. Um, in 2015, when I came home, this, the police came to find me and I thought it was probably my children's father trying to say I've stolen something. But um, they wanted to ask me about my childhood my relationship with my father. I was really confused, but they told me I had a half-sister. <clears throat> he was six at the time. And um, they told me that he had abducted her and taken her to India and put her in a school. And they asked me why I thought he had done that. And she was half Polish and half Punjabi. And I knew it was because of the Isa thing, the shame thing yeah. and honour. So I ex um, they explained to me that he'd abducted her and left her in a school and that she was my half-sister. And I was quite shocked, but I was really worried. You know, the first thing I thought about having a child myself was how this six-year-old would feel knowing how I felt at 21 when they beat me. And I said, I, I believe that he would have taken her there to kill her. And... Um, they said that they had gone over there, but the, they weren't allowed into this establishment, this school. And I said, well, why, why? That makes no sense to me. You know, she needs you to bring her back. She's a British citizen. Please bring her back. But they said that they were denied access and they're going to charge my father with abduction. And I was quite almost shocked, I'd say. But then I started to wonder about her and... um she led me into a dark path, I guess. Um, I thought I, it was my fault because I hadn't reported him. And I thought if I haven't reported him, he's not been held accountable for what he did to me. Not only the rape, but also the honour killing. Because of that, he's very um, sure of himself, very arrogant that he can get away with things. So he's gone and done this, thinking he can get away with it. My father came out of prison last year and everyone celebrated him in the community. They all said, you know, he's done a really good thing because he upheld his honour, you know, the Izzet. And he tied a tab and then they said, well, he's converted now, he's more religious. And nobody seemed to think he did anything wrong. And I decided I had to do something. So I said, I'll do 100 messages of my life for her, because I hadn't spoken up. So my first talk was the TED talk. Someone heard me talking and offered it to me. And I've been talking since and it hurts me to reopen these wounds. It, yeah. You can forgive, but you just don't forget. But I know by reopening these wounds, Somebody somewhere heals, someone somewhere hears something that they felt themselves that they haven't said out loud, but they've thought. But more so, all of them are my sisters, all of them are my daughters. So I feel I am of service. I'm doing my seva, as we call it, service to others by talking out. And people say she's a liar. And that's fine. 
because I'm standing in my truth. It's not easy. And I said at one point, you know, even when you, you asked, I said, I can't do it at the minute. I need an emotional break. But when the messages start to come through, I know I can't take that break just yet because somebody somewhere out there needs that message of hope that they can be okay, that they've got me. You know, I've got, I've started a non-profit where they can come to and I get it. And in terms of either you have a sister, has, have you ever <laughs> found her? Have you ever met her? If, what, why is, why is that situation now? I get so emotional about her. Okay. Um, I found that her name is Julia, Julia Cole. And, um, I also found that when he left her, um, that he would have sold her. Uh, it's a place where they harvest organs, which people don't understand what that means. It means they kill the child and sell their body parts, their organs to other people. And it's a common thing. Apparently this part of India makes a lot of money doing this. It took me down a dark place where I started to speak to organisations that help children that have been trafficked and women. And I became an advocate speaking out for them too. Because again, it's people don't ask questions when a girl disappears and ends up in Pakistan or India or South, wherever, you know, wherever she ends up. But they say she's got to live with her auntie or uncle. No one questions it. But a lot of the time they'll either be dead or sold. Um, and no one does anything about it, not the teachers, nobody, you know. And my, my sister, my father took my sister f from Heathrow to Poland, to, a, uh, to an airport, then to another country before he got to India. She didn't know him, yeah. but no one picked up on that. Now you're, you did post the video and it was, it was online and it went to what, 23 million people about your story and your journey and everything you've been through to know that you've helped even just with one girl yeah is massive like the amount of women even men that would have come out to speak about these truths and how like how many people you've actually helped you've done a massive thing you were brought on this earth to do something good and i just want you to know how much you are loved even if you might think you weren't brought, brought in this world and you weren't loved, right now is your time. You are loved more than you know because there's going to be so many women out there that genuinely appreciate your truth and you're helping one little girl tomorrow. And this is, this is what we need within our communities is someone to speak out and as unfortunate as it is, and I don't ever want to wish it on anyone, I'm glad you've had the strength to really just talk about it and coming on here today, honestly, it means a lot because not every single woman would do that. Yeah, it's not my story though. This is, my story is a story of so many other people. Yeah, um, and I believe I am love. You know, I said someone you said, are. someone said, "What would be your perfect job, Nina?" And I said, "I'd be a love letter. I would literally be handed out to people, and they would read something super positive about themselves and say those words and make them into a truth." Yeah. Because we're not shown how to love in our culture. There's, it's quite a loveless culture. It's quite aggressive. Um, the people think it's wishy-washy. It's, it's bagwas, as they call it in, in my language. But it's not. It's actually very empowering. And when you start to love yourself, everything else comes. You know, I'm, I, I do a lot of coaching now as well. But it, yeah. everything just comes to you. And it's a real well. And my real wealth is coming from helping these people. And when it first got to, I think, six million, I was quite surprised to be honest with you um and i said to a friend i've not met yet she's in america um she works with um victims for human trafficking too and i said well you know i've got six million but I just, i'm not bothered about that she said yeah. she said well you're not really egotistical so i know you're not bothered but that's six million messages that you've got across you're trying to get a hundred messages but you've done six you know million yeah. messages and then it just kept going up and going up and it's still, it's still going. So obviously there's a message, but people are coming forward from different communities. They're coming forward from cults. I've had a lot of people that have been put into cults, you know. Yeah. I've had a lot of women that have been forced onto drugs by partners, but a lot of men, a lot of men from domestic violence situations from our culture, where the women have come 
even from India and, and threatened that if they don't do what they're being told, that they will, you know, go and take them into a different way. But Australia, there's so many of our community in Australia coming forward too. And it and it is empowering for me to be able to help them. You know, and I, I, I make sure as you know, everyone, whoever it is that messages me, I, I scan through the messages. For the when they first started, I didn't sleep for two days. <laughs> And now I've got a system that I scan through to see who actually really needs urgent help. Yeah. Um, and then I go back to the other messages just to sort of because the people have taken the time to speak to me. Mm -hmm. I respect that. It's their time. Yeah. And am I right in thinking that you were awarded Woman of the Year <laughs> 2023 this year? I was. I was really surprised. That's um, the smile I wanted to be. <laughs> yeah, I was really surprised. I was, um, it was the House of Lords um, yeah. Parliament. I've been asked to leave quite a few times house of lords and <laughs> i was surprised that they'd asked me but yeah it was for my work with um raising awareness for honor killings and human trafficking um and not really giving up so yeah i was blessed to have that no honestly you you're blessed to be here your children are blessed to have a mother like you because i'm i, I know just sitting here right now how much you're going to shower shower them with love and give them the love that you didn't have originally but you know what you do you you do have that and I've said that now you have that from so many from those 23 people million that have seen that video you have that and more but I've I genuinely I don't know I don't know how to say I've loved loved the story because I have not but I've loved meeting you and just seeing the strength that is just being brought out and I really really appreciate you coming on today I do. Thank you for listening today. If you have experienced any of these issues that we've spoken about, please get in touch with one of our helplines.